let's take a look at uh, invention number one. This is one of my favorite things to teach at all levels. In fact, all inventions. What you find in Bach in general, and certainly inventions in particular, is uh, that they're filled with little tricks and gifts and little puzzles, since they're written uh, very much for Bach's own son, and eventually sons, um, to practice from. I always feel like he's sitting, he Bach, Papa Bach is sitting right there and going, did you know, did you know this? There's a trick here. So at the University of Chicago, we do a Bach project every year where we, we do a whole huge uh, amount of repertoire as a studio. And this year we did Inventions and Symphonias. And even though it's not the first time we've done that, I'm yet finding new little numerology tricks, uh, this kind of trick, that kind of trick. They're fascinating pieces. Um, kids, it would be nice if they found all of these little, cute little tricks, but they don't. So it's our job to do so. And then their eyes lit up and uh, we're getting a completely different performance. Because too many times I hear my 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds coming and saying, Bach is boring. That's like waving red in front of a bull. So uh, then we have to go to work at it. It would be really great if they didn't think Bach was boring, starting with the very first invention. So let's take a look and analyze a little bit and see if we can find uh, what makes it tick. So uh, we have um, our very simple little subject. Not much to it. And so it's a treatment of the subject that makes all the difference. So I've analyzed it as much as possible uh, in the sheet. Um, I think we've all done it. So we know the number three is very important to Bach. So this particular, well, it's a holy number. He's very much into numerology. So uh, in this invention, number three um, is used like three times. There's three individual little patterns. Each one used three times. So in A1, of the subject uh, arranged in pairs, right, left, right, left. Okay, so that's our A1. In B2, we now have the subject which has uh, been flipped over, inverted, and it appears in a sequence four times in a row, going down number one, number two, three, and four. Okay, and finally in the C section, we have one appearance of the subject now right way up again. another inverted subject, but this time it's really cool because it grows a tail. It doesn't end. It starts wagging. It's really cute and really adorable and an interesting treatment of the subject. And so now we've had our group one, group two, and group three, uh, which are now repeated with variations. Okay, so now we, we look at the next A. So what's wrong with it now? Instead of four repetitions of the subject, we now have eight. Okay, well that's great. Uh, why are there eight? Well, let's see. Um, they still alternate hands, right? So we have right side up. Oh, interesting. That's completely different. Hmm. Harmonically, now they've become much more interesting. So now I think of them as more like a question and answer. So to me, there are still four repetitions, except each repetition consists of a question and answer. Does that make sense? Four is also a holy number, an interesting number. So um, then we come to the B. That's the most hated section, as uh, we all know, because those B flats just cannot be remembered and need to be in every possible color and very big. I don't know about your scores, but that's all my students like look like with like a hole because I've pressed that flat in so many times, right? But um, other than the flat, it's actually exactly the same as the previous B section because we still have four inverted repetitions of the subject and uh, in a sequence still going down, just in the left hand, right? Okay, fine. Then we have the C, which um, again, while the hands are, hands are flipped and some more notes are, are, are added, it's identical to the original C section in that it has the right side up subject and it has an, uh, an inverted subject again with uh, a tail leading to a cadence. Okay. So, so far we established uh, sort of very clear um, structural ideas in that the A section has expanded, but the B and the C sections so far have stayed pretty much similar. And then we come to the third, um, third large section. Well, again, in the, uh, A3, we have again eight repetitions of the subject. They no longer seem to be arranged in pairs, so eight has become the thing. And 
it's very interesting. There's nothing against them, just a health note. So all cool. And then let's take a look at the B. So who can tell me what's uh, quote unquote wrong with the final B section? So how is the final B section different than the previous B sections? Inverted. Okay, more. It, what, oh, maybe we should define the term that the subject is not inverted. What is inverted? Well, we've already had um, uh, we've already had the right hand playing uh, the subject in you know in the first B section. Sorry, B section. Thank you very much. Okay, we got a winner. Speak up. <laughs> there, there's only three sections. In the there are only four. three repetitions in this inversion, but there's something else even more crucial. How is this particular sequence different from the previous two sequences? And it's, as I said, the crux it's of the mess. So it's going up. Yeah. It's absolutely going up. So um, remember, three is the ultimate holy number for Bach. Remember, Bach thinks everything through a Lutheran viewpoint. Absolutely everything. It's part of Lutheran education to, to hide a, a little um, uh, uh, religious sort of questions and puzzles into every subject you study. It's, it's part of the way Bach thinks. So now the, uh, our, our sequence is turned up. We're reaching, in fact, what's going to be the highest note of the piece. There are three repetitions because three wins out, because it is the ultimate holy number. And um, do you see how few people notice this? I'm sure each of you have taught this piece a gazillion times. And yet this is what this piece is all about. It's that line that makes everything tick. And shockingly, you can find something of this nature in just about every invention and in every symphonia. Um, in the symphonias, the puzzles get more complicated. And in a fugues, I'm sure I'm missing, you know, 90% of them. Because Bach is just so much smarter than all of us are. And by the time you get to something horrifying like the art of fugue, I'm sure we're barely scratching the surface and understanding any of it. And yet, the fun of sitting there with a the pencil and analyzing the, um, all of his polyphony is just beyond belief because it gives you so much joy. Because practicing this piece is hard. Our, our brain, again, is not very good about coordinating two hands. It's not something we do. Uh, and, and certainly very difficult for a seven, eight, nine-year-old who first touches this invention. So um, when they understand what the point is, suddenly um, there's a desire to make musical decisions. So for example, if the important thing is the sequence is now going up, so probably we want to crescendo it rather a lot to arrive at the highest note in sort of a moment of glory. So what does that tell us about the previous um, B section, the previous sequences? Well, I'm thinking we probably want to diminuendo. I think that would like, make a lot of sense, right? Uh, so that we can show off a crescendo. Also, if the number, the specific number of repetition is this important, we probably do not want to play the first one like this. Because we cannot tell what's actually happening. And uh, certainly no listener can count um, the number of repetitions. So probably we want to make sure we hear where each one begins and ends. Exaggerating in our ungodly fashion right now. But I would rather take an exaggeration and clarity um, than a robotic sort of performance. So I talk, um, I, I, I rather enjoy um, teaching Bach a great deal just because of that Bach is boring thing that comes to me. So I will expound just a little bit more on Bach pedagogy in general because I can't help myself. So there are two, there are two horrifying extremes that at least that come to me in Bach playing. Um, one is this completely robotic performance that Bach is boring because that kind of playing really is boring, you can't deny it. And then there's the other extreme where a person understands that uh, Bach is great music and needs to be truly um, expressed. So what they bring to me is what I call Bachmaninov. <laughs> um, right? I wish I'd come up with that, but I didn't. The harpsichord is a friend of mine did, alas. But um, so that kind of playing, it's, 
actually somewhat more pleasant to listen to because at least it's alive and it has feeling in it, but it's also ineffective because it does not bring out what makes the music tick. So putting big romantic gestures into a piece that wasn't designed to have them it just makes it sound like a bad quality harmonium you know, rather than excellent quality Bach. So the idea is to find what is the internal motivation in each phrase of Bach, in each gesture, and just even the counting. Um, as I said, counting how many times things happen suddenly creates a need for expression that's appropriate to the style and therefore much more effective.